Hello there. Welcome to our World Today Vignonist Perspective. I'm very happy to be with you as every week. And today we are going to talk about something that is pretty sensitive yet again. Um, it is a continuation of what we talked about last week um, in the Israel-Gaza conflict and Israel-Hamas war. And basically today we um, stumbled upon like a number of videos and articles kind of like trying to prove that um one side or like that Israelis were like bad and wanted to colonize or that Palestinians were like not as innocent as as they said they were and it was kind of disturbing for us because it was like it, it feels like a lot of disinformation is not verified. Uh, there are a lot of loopholes in the things, and we want to assure that we're like on the side of like peace, and we want to just make sure that the truth is out there. And problem is that the truth may not always be um, something that feels comfortable to you. And it may not always be as black and white as it is presented um, on social media. And we want to take all of that with a grain of salt. And that's why we have this discussion every week um, in order to really like decriminalize anything, like not vilify everything, like remove um, the heightened drama around everything and, and just go to compassionately seek for facts and truth and with this like we got the help of like um specialists around um analyzing the news from abc they posted a video around the israel gaza misinformation and i reposted it actually in the unionism discussion group so you can like access that and we'll make sure it's in the description on youtube and they have a lot of advice on like how to search for your information, uh, what sources to take. But at the beginning of that, um, they also explain why there have been there has been such misinformation um, on the internet. And they start, for example, with like uh, people saying that um, a Palestinian citizen was like faking his death um, in the streets of Gaza, where it was actually um, a movie made two years ago, for example. Um, they took like, um, they said that Gaza was like burning or something, or I don't know what was burning exactly, where it was actually like football, um, I think Croatian football fans that were burning the little like red thing that they burn in stadiums in another country entirely. And they took some images of the ruins of Ukraine and said that it was like um, at the Israel Gaza border. And you have to be careful about what you see on the internet. And I see it in the kids that, uh, you know, I teach in middle school. Um, they trust people that are in their community. A lot of them are Muslim, but like a, a lot of the people that they follow on TikTok are hurt and talking from a very hurt place without verifying the information. And so a lot of people have access to information that is not verified and you have to be careful because there is a lot of resharing it and in the intention of resharing it maybe the intention is that you will help seek the truth or you want people to agree with you which is okay it's a very human thing to do but it's also very dangerous in the circumstances and so we have an example of how it happened with like a marine deal made in the Mediterranean Sea 
uh, between Israel and like the Italian government and how it was used to basically like for some people um, as proof that um, Israel was colonizing the resources of Palestine. And I, I would love for Sage to like explain to us um, how she studied this information and went deep until she found like some facts and truth to like support this. Yeah, it, it was, um it was really interesting. You know, I find fact checking to be fun because you're going to the, tr you're trying to find the real truth of it. And it's also fun because the more that you fact check and research into something, the more peaceful and grounded you can be about your actual views on something. Um, it's also really, really cool to um, not only try to know the information, but also understand people's perspectives or um, agendas, whatever it is, or intentions there and to just be more aware of that. So I thought that was, that was cool, but um. Oh, also as a disclaimer, like I <clears throat> just researched this little thing, like I don't really know yet like a whole lot about the Israel-Palestine thing, because it's just like a gigantic, massive topic. And it's, you know, even there are experts who have many different views on it, even though they've spent like a lot of their life studying it, I feel. So I guess we should keep that in mind and everything, but yeah. So anyway, the video that we all discussed amongst ourselves was on Instagram and someone was talking about how, so there's like this big deposit, a fairly big deposit of natural gas, um, 22 miles off the coast of Gaza. Um, there's like a couple different ones, but they're all kind of called the Gaza Marine. Um, that's like a name for it. And, um, I think it was discovered in like, I don't know, like 2007 or 2010. I don't remember, but like a, a while ago. Um, but the the issue was it kind of straddles, like it's, it's off the coast of Gaza. It's technically in Israeli waters and it's partially in Egyptian waters because it's like right there. So because of all the political conflict around this, um, in, you know, including between um, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, um, it wasn't developed for the longest time, and it's still not. It's still not developed. And so, yeah, just recently, like um, a deal was was struck. I guess uh, tentatively, um, only the Israeli side announced it um, on social media, which was interesting. Everyone else, I think, felt a little bit too unsure about it, but what they were trying to do was um, start giving companies rights to explore the Gaza Marine to access that natural gas. And the plan was, because it was a deal between the Israeli government, um, the Palestinian Authority, um, Hamas was made to agree to this, because for the longest time Hamas said the Palestinian Authority is like, to, they're corrupt, and so they can't be included in this deal because they'll somehow like siphon off I don't know money from it and Egypt was in the deal too and that deal was made in June so there there was finally like some sort of like agreement to like use that and the agreement would be that the natural gas from that would completely supply all the Palestinian territories so Gaza and um the territories in the West Bank and plus there'd be enough for export too um, and I don't know the details beyond that but that's basically what it was um, so yeah so that happened in June and then the um, yeah and then the Israel Hamas war started in October and ever since then that's kind of been on hold because yeah it's just like really not super not super safe to do that. Plus, you know, Israel has a lot of other stuff on its hands too. And Gaza is also obviously in turmoil there. So yeah, but anyway, this video that we saw, it was basically trying to say that like, um, like just recently, like in late October, there was a deal where 
um, different companies, including BP, which is British, and and any, which is like an Italian company, were given some rights to explore some new natural gas fields um, underneath the ocean, right? And but this video is trying to say this contract is evidence that um, uh, Israel was trying to invade Gaza because they wanted to crush Gaza's resistance to Israel exploiting the natural gas off of Gaza's coast. But in the article that that person shared in her um, in her Instagram video, it was clear that this was like way far away from Gaza. So this was like close to the Leviathan um, natural gas deposit or whatever you call it. And um, it was like, that's in like the far north of Israel's territorial waters. So it has nothing to do with Gaza, that recent deal. So it's interesting, yeah. And it just shows how like, um, yeah, you just, I feel like you just can't like, <clears throat> when a lot of when a lot of like negative emotion is involved like when a lot of like anger is involved or there's there's resentment or somebody maybe maybe they already feel like we're all inclined to believe what we already believe unless we like consciously choose to let that go um you know so yeah and which i which i did as well because you know before i had a lot of like anti-Israeli sentiment and a lot of anger toward the Israeli government because that's who I hung out with was people who were more like on the far left of the political spectrum you know what I mean and so I was like I even at one point I was like oh Israel like shouldn't have even exist in the first place and all of this like way back in college you know because like that's what everybody around me who I hung out with was saying but yeah, this just shows that you've really got to dig in and like fact check things. And it brings a lot more peace and understanding, I feel, to like know what's going on there. Um, yeah, that's that's that basically. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I feel like um, I, I have to agree with you. I feel like in my culture, I think because we we are people of color, um, people tend to side on, on the left side of the political spectrum. Or when you're a pe person of color, people tend to side with Palestine um, a lot more. And I mean, like, when you see one side of the story every day um, about, like, how, how Palestinians are being, like... Um, you know, oppressed or that they don't have the same rights or that some Israelis are trying to take land and, and this it's true that some extremists, not all Israelis, but some extremists are trying to take the land in Sister Rodani, even in the in the kind of like weird agreement that they have. There's still like some problems with that that have been noting by the United Nations. Um, you tend to say like, oh my God, they just like really wanted to just like uh, take the land, colonize it, and be done with it, and like exterminate Palestinians or like make them go away in the rest of the Middle East or something like that. But then like when you see like the whole picture, you're like. People really needed a land where where they they felt they felt safe, and it's more complicated than that. Um, there are several wars to like uh, make us understand, but it's more complicated than that. Um, you can group Palestinians and Palestinian freedom with like a terrorist group, and also like. Um, like everyone has a, I don't know, I don't know what I wanted to say, but it's more like it, you know, this marine deal in September, is just proving that not everyone like people want peace now. You know, we're not in an era of like wanting war anymore. 
not in an era of like wanting to overly shift um the order of things and maybe the order of things do need to change but i think people want desire peace um on top of everything and the fact that we would go to like terrorist attacks to make some sort of change happen and we don't even know what change it is because hamas has proven that they're not necessarily on the side of the palestinian government and so like how far are they ready to take this um it feels like it, it's not okay but at the same time i don't feel it doesn't feel comfortable saying that all palestinians are not innocent or like all israelis are not innocent it's like um yeah they're just humans and they're just miscommunication there's been miscommunication for a century obviously we need to resolve that not um try to try to take a side by by sharing information but it's proving your point and i feel like it's kind of unhealthy first of all to stay in that sphere of where you're just trying to like convince someone of your um political opinion so much that you forget that there are also other people on the other side or like you forget yourself or like you forget to check and verify that it's true and there is also this thing about like the more you push you try to push your information forcefully the more people are just going to tense even more and even when they weren't on the side of of anyone they'll be forced to like they, they they would feel forced to like uh take a side and say like hey chill or um no you're not right and things like that and so um, i feel like what we're doing now is um basically it's complicated because a lot of people could see this as like hey we're trying to undermine like palestinian spain or Israeli Spain, and that's not bad at all. Like, we need to, like, create a world where we can coexist with the truth, however uncomfortable that is, and and know that there are actually people that care about both sides and and care about no sides at all and, and just care about the truth and just care about, like, making peace and just care about facts, you know? Yeah, I really appreciate the clarity that we're bringing because it's so easy to like sway one side over the other, especially given all the misinformations that we get. But the way that we can discern from what the information we get and bring more light to it and more clarity is where we can keep moving forward for peace. And it reminds me of like the Russian and Ukraine war that's going on right now. Although we do see that Ukraine is defending themselves and Russia is coming to attack, we must see on both sides of like how humanity is like, Russia is also losing men and women and Ukraine is losing men and women. And we need to recognize where the peace stands and which way peace will be brought. And of course, uh, Hamas and Pal Palestine and Israel is such a more complex and layered issue compared to the clarity we're receiving for Ukraine and Russia. But it still motivates us to see which way is peace, which way is it able to view like peace. And I think the the oil deal that is going on, if it goes down as fair and equal when it comes to land and location and how the resources would be split, would be beneficial for all. 
And I hope that that's how it goes down. And for one um, party, let's say Hamas, to believe that it won't be fair or not go forward because you know one party is taking more of the cake than the other, or think that that's what's going to happen is not really um, on the side of peace. It's just on the side of more drama, more issues, more like war to come from it. So it's really not like, can this oil deal benefit only Palestine, but it's okay to benefit Israel, Palestine, Egypt, whoever is of benefit for this. So that's how I feel about that. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Um, when we see an article like that uh, being published in the middle of a crisis, and that seemingly, seemingly has nothing to do with a crisis when, when we dig into it, do you feel that um, the intention is on the side of truth, or do you feel like... Um, this is just like, I don't know, because it feels like um, the publishing of an article like that, like without explanation, um, is like, hey, you do what you do with that information. It's not like our responsibility to like help you seek the truth. You just make your own opinion of that. But in a in a climate of tension, like it would encourage people to just like use that information for whatever. And that's what we've seen. And so it feels like in, in on the side of misinformation, um, it seems like the media has a, a huge responsibility to to maybe say like, hey, um, this isn't for, this isn't drama, this is like real life, like what is the truth? And it feels like there is a, there's a big like mishappening um, on that front. Which yeah. article are you referring to? The TikTok or the oil New Deal that you were talking about? Uh, the Marin Deal, um, the Reuters article that, um, Talking about the on Instagram shared, like oh, uh, the he based our information upon. Okay, okay, yeah, no, you said you wanted to say something. I just wanted to clarify which article, yeah. Um, yeah, that article itself didn't seem too biased, it's just the way the person in the Instagram video like tried to use it basically. Mm -hmm. um was but yeah so and um yeah I guess this just um I feel like with all the misinformation and stuff it it can fuel both like people being really partisan but it can also kind of fuel um disengagement with the whole the issue as a whole because I feel like uh, sometimes people look at it and they're like you know, including myself, like in the past, like look at it and they're like, well, there's so much conflicting information. I, and it's just, you know, both sides are so, are so biased and I just can't form any conclusion off of this. So I'm just going to disengage from it basically because of that. And I mean, I guess it's not a reason to disengage. It's a reason to engage, but like critically you know, but I feel like it's most healing not to like just push tons of potentially untrue information because it just adds to that climate, you know, of either being really partisan or just being like totally like disengaged from it. So the news media too, like watching this yesterday, a video about it, I was like, yeah, it just really highlights how the media like even if it's presenting information that's factual, they create an atmosphere of like drama, almost as like 
as if like this were some sort of like movie for people to enjoy mm -hmm. like it's like the entertainment industry and it's just appalling you know really like you shouldn't be you know making money making an entertainment spectacle off of off of all of this but that's that is what the media does like almost entirely depending on the outlet so yeah and that's just not what we choose to do like we choose to dedicate ourselves to finding the peace and finding the truth there and like finding what the the upsets are and what the healing is not like making this into some like entertainment <laughs> spectacle because I was like geez like you guys like really don't like you must be really numbed out to to work there or you agree with that you know I guess I don't know what you'd have to do to do that but yeah that's what I was feeling from this dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that way too. Like the continuation of this war must be benefiting someone. And where is that benefit going? Like, who is it truly? Like, I know we're explaining that this drama is definitely benefiting um, the news media. And, but this continuation of war between like land domination who is this really benefiting? I wanted to ask you guys how you guys feel about that. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I wasn't saying that the media was... Um, uh, I'm, I'm not implying, though, that I think that the war is, like, caused by them or media for their benefit. So I'm not doing conspiracy theory. Oh, um, no, no. I didn't yeah. say that either. No, no, no. I'm I know. Like yeah. The misinformation is definitely benefiting media. Right, right. Because they, they just feed on the drama and they just add to the drama, which only makes things worse, is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. as far as we know, we could be even experiencing peace in Israel and Palestine and we wouldn't know. Like, there's so much misinformation that we'd be thinking like <laughs> they're in turmoil and there might be peace, more peace than we even know of. Yeah, yeah. We we don't really know. It's very murky. Um, I feel like even though like I've heard of this conflict my whole life, obviously, like most people, um, I'm only now discovering like sides of um, you know, Israel and Palestine that I didn't know of, and. I am very, very, very uncomfortable <clears throat> with, um, I guess what I heard like during the end of October on like French radios and things like that, like at first it was very like, um, you know, trying to explain the political landscape of Israel and Palestine, trying to explain that like everywhere there are extremists you know that and they're not necessarily the, the majority of the people even though they have like a huge voice because like in Israel like there is um kind of um moral obligation to never like shut down anyone that wants to speak after the Holocaust and things like that. Um but uh then it turned into like trying to interview someone like an Israeli that wanted to um buy land and had bought had bought or had taken land on a border with Palestine and basically wanted all Palestinians of his his um his way to see peace was like um hey, maybe Palestinians can go in, in Jordan or in other countries and, and Israel is like a promised land. And you're like, you're, like, you're making in, in, in this war where you should be reporting the war, you're making um, interviews of very extremist branch of the people in extremist, <laughs> extreme part 
of like borders with like sensitive history and I don't know like does does it again like do do you make an interview of someone that has uh, an opinion that is contrary to that afterward no you don't so um you don't really present a, a landscape of like what everybody is thinking and I feel like we hear from always the same people and if you go obviously to someone that has just been been bombed in Gaza, they're going to suffer. So we're not going to tell you anything about like your political reality of what is going on with governments and groups and factions and things like that. They just want to feel safe. They just want their suffering to end. So like um, in the way to portray um people that are leaving there, there is also extremism, in my opinion, because you go to people that are on the extreme spectrums of life and never the opposite, never the like. And it's not to undermine anyone's suffering because that wouldn't do, but like, what about what about other people like are are we going to feel that one person uh, at a border is going to represent a whole people um and I, I don't know it's very complex but i think there is there also is a responsibility to say like are you doing your job completely if you're only reporting from one side or like or is there actually one side and are you like clarifying that there is one side? Because it feels like there are different sides to our stories. Otherwise, otherwise people wouldn't be fighting on social media for different sides if there weren't different sides. Like, so yeah, it's just that. And it's just like, um, It feels it feels so tense to like just stay in that atmosphere of like drama as well. Where there actually can be we know that there can be peace inside and it feels so tense to actually be in that in this extreme of like um completely disengaging or completely bipartisan or completely disengaging or bipartisan. It feels like very unstable. And I think a lot of people just want to find the middle ground. And actually, the middle ground is not necessarily the middle ground. It's kind of like on the twin flame journey. Um, you're not going to find middle ground between like completely blocking your twin flame or completely chasing them. You're going to find middle ground in finding peace in yourself. So completely removing yourself from the spectrum. And from that peace, weirdly enough, you're going to, or not weirdly enough, if you know the spiritual laws, you're going to attract uh, peace from the outside as well. And that feels much better. But um, I think humanity has a, has, has a bit of a hard time to grasp, um, to grasp that at this time. And so I will continue to like, um, help with that and change it one one fact at a time, hopefully. And I think it's continued to be such a like hard topic to grasp because of like the religious factor of it. And Palestine, Israel being such a holy land, it is like so hard for one area to go to Jordan while um, another area stays, you know, one religion stays while another religion goes. So like, I feel like, I, I don't know, if it was like Texas or something, maybe one part would be like, yeah, sure, we'll leave. Not saying anything about Texas, but like, I think cause it's such a holy land, um, people are so adamant, like, no, this is my land. This is where I stay, you know? And um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like just your just your statement is very like peaceful. Like 
this is this is my holy land and this me that's how people feel and um I guess we just have to respect how people feel it doesn't mean that the situation is never going to change but in antagonizing them you're just going to like make them entrench themselves more instead of like having a discussion of like how does this feel like what's the holy land exactly like how do you feel about it how do you find peace how do you find your holiness and uh, then they would say like oh, okay feels like the holiness is inside me the holiness isn't like for me living in a certain place or maybe not or maybe i was wrong or maybe i was right um but it feels like a way healthier conversation by just saying like you're still in my land, like, your holy land is not my holy land, <laughs> or something like that. And it just, like, speaks to maybe not accepting that other religion can be, other religions can be holy too, and that you can find truth, and you can find your way to God through these other things as well. And that saddens me a lot, because I come from, from a very mixed culture that says, like, hey, like, whoever you are talking to your religion like it is the same god and maybe this god can be cruel for you masculine feminine whatever um concepts you have but it's still like god you know yeah and if you really go down to the core of it for the healing you would see in both religions is aiming for peace and both religions is aiming for looking at the divinity of your brothers and sisters. So if you truly want to follow the holiness within, it would be to accept not only yourself, but to accept your neighbors um, on both cases. So, yeah. Yeah, and on the topic of acceptance, what um what you guys were just talking about, I really liked it brought me a lot of relief because um, you know, I realized that to some extent in world affairs, you know, I was like trying to control the choices of others, which obviously I can't I'm not messaging people in Russia or Palestine or anywhere and being like, hey, like you need to make a different choice, but in internally wishing like being like I wish people would make a different choice in this is like trying to control someone's choice and you know here in the church of union and everything like we're taught to always respect the choices of others and just doing that brings so much relief because you're just like it's yeah I respect that that person's making that choice and I'm not going to try to control them but I'm just I only have control over my choices and that's more than enough that's enough yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah. Welcome. That's what I'm learning as well. Um, filling boundaries and like respecting people's choice and respecting that I have my own choice. Now. I don't really have like to defend it all the time. I just want to exist and exist in this peace and just like putting boundaries of people that don't really want me to exist and I think that's the same for like a whole lot of people. They're either like choosing to learn it or they're choosing not to learn their lesson. But I think a whole lot of people are going through the same thing. So uh, a lot of whole lot of compassion to them because it's not like as easy as it sounds if you've had like a reality of like being abused your whole life or like violence or like you didn't choose you you don't choose where you're born but like, definitely like we can we can change our reality one choice at a time and so um on that note we're going to transition to talking a little bit about cryptocurrencies um and we're talking about not Sam Beckman free but a realization from some people that after um his trial like a lot of like cryptocurrencies um and cryptocurrency companies might not have the best intentions not that money is bad or things like that but more like um the 
the absence of regulation of this market um, causes like extremes to happen uh, and dangerous case of like handling of money and yeah I just want to like leave it up to you guys it's going to be like a short one because um, we don't have our economist our specialist today but um just your feeling about like cryptocurrency and uh, how maybe Beckman free might not be like the only one like mismanaging people's money um because we like it's not it's not something of a conspiracy we do have facts about like how our cryptocurrencies are very unstable so yeah what's your feeling on that yeah it's um like i feel like the thing about the cryptocurrency is that i was watching a video about it originally it had to do with um it was inspired supposedly according to this thing that i saw it was inspired by the movement for greater online privacy because um you know with bank transactions like everything can be traced with cryptocurrency it's much more difficult to trace because every um like transaction is assigned like some number like numerical code and can't always attach to people but you can kind of like follow the num certain numbers around and stuff but it's not as like transparent as banking but their hope was that it would increase privacy and it would increase ease of doing business because you don't have like um different like things shaping like what's the value of a currency we have to do our currency exchange and that costs money and that takes time it takes time to send our money to other countries and we just don't like that so we can create an alternative currency but it ended up just becoming like a speculative asset like not a currency at all because a currency's value um, unless people are doing things to manipulate it, which they often are, but not to such a great extent as with crypto, a currency's value is based on the productivity of the economy of country and other things, you know, with that. So it's like tied to something. And while it does seem kind of slow and heavy, um, the cryptocurrency, like, you know, the fact that it's not regulated, it's not supervised, like it's decentralized. So every single transaction is um, recorded and verified by people who receive a fee to do that. And these people supposedly like they have an incentive to be honest about what's going on each time they record a transaction because they're invested in crypto too and they want it to be... Um, to have a reputation of trustworthiness and honesty, right? And so that was the whole idea of it. But apparently, you know, people who design these um, systems or who control them, they find ways around them, you know, be and there's no oversight. And so, so what you saw with Sam Bateman Freed and with other, yeah, leaders of companies, the crypto, you guys, and I just feel like it's so like, it seems like, um, a neon red flag like that there's no oversight on this and it seems to just stoke people's desire to try to like yeah get rich without doing anything like adding any value to the economy at all and investing though is good because that is doing something like if you put your money in something saying hey i support this that's cool but this is kind of just like completely like speculative, like saying like, um, I don't know, like just convincing everybody that they just, they want something like it's as, it's as meaningless as being like, um, like this mug, it's like, this mug is like so hot. It's like such a hot product. Like everyone has to have this. Let's just convince everybody that they want it. And then they, everyone wants it. And now my mug's valued at like $2 billion and this is $2 billion worth of the economy. And as soon as everyone wakes up to the fact that my mug is only worth like pretty much nothing, like a secondhand mug, like, come on, 
it's worth nothing. Now the co economy's lost $2 billion of imaginary valuation. I feel like that's what <laughs> cryptocurrency is, you know? And besides, this mug is priceless to me because it's so adorable. So I would never sell it or, yeah, turn it into a speculative asset. So that's what I do. I love that. I love this illustration. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people have this hope that um, um, this new money would work. And the fact that it's like yet another speculative bubble um, feels like it's not as out of system as one would think when they naively invest into crypto into cryptocurrencies because you have to have a level of understanding of how you can benefit from the system to make it and not to go deeper into like kind of theory about that but I think like the spiritual truth is that a lot of people think that absence of regulation is freedom. I think we were all told that absence of regulation is freedom. Whereas more and more you see that actually like just playing the game, mastering it, and then from mastering it, changing it and, and getting out of it um, is the actual freedom. So discipline can be the actual freedom. Uh, following certain rules for yourself can be an actual freedom. And I think that's where we, we as, you know, as humans, we get stumped because we're like, oh my God, you're making rules or I have to be, be disciplined. So you're coercing me or forcing me or pushing me. We're actually like, yeah, in spiritual truth, like the universe would just say, like, okay, this is your way to freedom, actually. Stop, like deluding yourself into like a revolutionary thing that would bring you freedom because if it would it was actually bringing us freedom like we would already know it, it would already have benefited like a, a lot more people i think and yeah that's just that right there is nothing much more to that that just um we're going to have like spikes of like People saying that this thing is valuable and revolutionary and will make you rich and free in like two days. And oh. that's just not how reality works. <laughs> so yeah, it just we we just gotta be okay with that. And uh just to just take on our little path and and actually invest in things like me seem hard or pushy or pressurizing but are actually the, the right way to freedom and happiness and joy yeah. yeah the fact that there was no regulation was like you said a big neon red flag and i wanted to ask and maybe granville would be the expert to answer this but of course, how you guys feel about it. I know we talked about upping the game when it comes to boundaries and regulations in banks, because it definitely needs more regulation to avoid bailouts and using people's money in investments that like leads to um, bank failures. How do you guys compare these bank failures to cryptocurrency failures and um, you know, like one that already is like regulated, but it still ends up having, um, you know, fails, failings. And then there's cryptocurrency, which didn't have much regulation, but it still ended up investing and losing a lot of people's money. Um, for me, I feel that both definitely needs more regulation, more oversight. Um, how do you guys feel about that? I think mostly it's the fact that they're not as different as it seems. In fact, they're the same. Because we had a few months ago a whole discussion. I don't I don't think we were, were here in that job when we had that, but I'm not sure. A whole discussion about how like um the virtual money system is worth like two trillion dollars. 
And so when you see that, like, it's like virtual money, virtual money, speculative bubble, speculative bubble, you realize that they're both the same at the core. And I think it's just that. And uh, I think it's just a system that at large needs to be more grounded into reality. Simple as that. Yeah. Anything else on it? So we're going to um not misinformation, but maybe sensationalization of the information about Mike jo Johnson and um our umpteenth episodes around the Congress, around Congress. Um so basically like a lot of people are now focusing on, on Meg Jackson, the new uh, speaker of the house. Is that how you say this? It's not really a spokesperson, it's a speaker, right? Um, yeah, so the speaker of the house and how he adopted a black kid or um, his ties to like religious groups. And again, it feels like sharing this information at first would feel um like something of like surveying that the leader that you're putting in place is someone that is trustworthy but it just feels like sense sensations uh, drama um in the end yet again and so i just want to have your feelings on it and it's like what is the truth like where why are we not making the right choices with Congress? And why are we, why does it feel like again and again, we're not focusing on, on the right things? Yeah, that's what I don't appreciate when we don't focus on the right things. And yet instead we're spreading misinformation or rather sensationalized stories to fit a like particular perspective and viewpoint and to cater to a certain um, political stance rather than work towards going to the core of it and seeing what the main mission is and how humanity can be served as whole. And I, I just feel like the true work is not being done, you know, rather the surface work is just getting done and things are being uh, molded and percept like there's a perspective being done so that um, people are appeased to a certain um, degree. But the true work of um, healing and change and peace and grounding into what is beneficial for all the whole country, I don't feel is being done. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah. Yeah, Nadia, I completely agree. Like, I feel like with, with Mike Johnson, all the stories that are swirling around him, they have nothing to do, mo most of the, I mean, what we were talking about, you know, with his son and everything, and they have nothing to do with anything about the choices he's making now, his qualifications, uh, what he brings to the table as like a leader, you know, it's like, Total BS, but what it does address is, should we like him or should we dislike him? And that's all it's talking about, you know? So it's kind of, it's like, and we, it's just, ugh, no, not good. Like, for example, like people were making a big fuss about, yes, his son, like he has two sons and one uh, is his and his wife's biological child and the other was um, adopted uh, when he was 14 years old and that's his his um, African-American son named Michael and just people are just trying to spin this whole thing like there's some people on who some views are saying like um like why is Mike Johnson like in on his political website none of the pictures include you know, his son, Michael. And like, why is he excluding his African-American 
adopted son, you know, but including his like white biological son. And then um, some people trying to say that, um, you know, he's a really good guy because he and his wife, like when they were newly married, I believe like adopted this kid who was like 14, like a lot of older kids, like don't get, don't end up getting adopted for a long time or at all. And, you know, he kind of came from like a rough background and stuff and family life. And like this, he's such a nice guy and everything like that for adopting this kid. And then yet more people would see it as like trying to advance like a white savior narrative. So that Mike Johnson is like, yeah, positioning himself as like superior or as a savior. And to me, my first impression when I was looking through all this, and I don't know about you guys was, this seems really like the way the media was going about it just seems really inappropriate and insensitive because it's like, this should be the last of your priorities, man. Like this has nothing to do with this guy's choices he's making right now or his qualifications as a leader. Like you need to back off, you know, like that was what I felt about it. And yeah. Mike Johnson himself said um, his son, Michael, just didn't want to be featured in any of his pictures on his political websites or whatever pages. And I'm like, yeah, that's reasonable. He doesn't want to be featured in it. Everyone, shoo, like, you know, angry mob, go away, go back to your day job, you know? But nobody that's asked him that. That's the yeah. thing, nobody asked him. And that's what we're, see we're seeing but in our reality. Nobody, nobody is asking have relevant questions and it's not their job to investigate that the very first thing that i thought was like hey does he want to be featured on the website does he want his image used and even then like they're saying that he's a white savior but he doesn't use the pictures of his son on the website so how does that even make sense right make it make sense like people are just yeah no that's just hey that's none of our problems and how does best that qualify him to be a speaker at the house? Again, again, yeah, it's just nonsense that we feel like we have to spend in order to like fill our brain with more nonsense and more drama. And it's just like it feels like it's numbing to the brain. And I think maybe people have enough of that. Yeah, I was just going to say that like media wants to cater to that very shallowness type of thinking so that you are sustained with that shallow, you know, taste of, oh, let's think about what he affiliates with in religion, what his household is, rather than going down to a very deep discussion on what they feel is best for them as a nation, you know? Yeah. And I think we're going, we could go deeper on that because there, there's so much to explore there, but it's like the whole message of today was, um, you know, being overly extreme and polarized or like completely numbed out um, to the truth and disengaged and uh, fake neutral can be very harmful for a lot of people and actually prevent us from seeing the truth. And with that, we're just going to close our discussion for today and thank everyone who's watched us live and on YouTube. And if you appreciate our content and, and want to share your insight, definitely like, subscribe, comment under our videos. We'd love to see your feedback on this. And yeah, we, with that, we're just going to wish you a good day, good night, and see you next week. Bye-bye.